Hello and welcome to PM Express. My name is Nana Ansakwa and today we are looking at free speech, where to go and where not to go. You see, one of the greatest gifts that God gave human beings is the ability to speak. Uh, one significant thing that distinguishes us from animals is our ability to speak or communicate by our voice. All civilizations realize how important this is and enshrined it in their laws one way or the other. In the 1992 Constitution, you find it in Article 21, which guarantees you the right to free speech. It doesn't say that once you're responsible, then you can speak freely. It just says speak freely, responsible or not. So where do you draw the line? You go to the... Uh, UN Charter for Human Rights, and it's enshrined in there, which Ghana is a signatory to. So as far as free speech is concerned, it is literally what makes our civilization move forward. Then again, you know, we have Samir Wuku criticizing the judges, saying that they are unfair uh, and not, you know, literally biased. The judge calls him, reprimands him, uh, stops him from coming to court. Then you have Ken Crunchy. Uh, also repeating what Samir Oku says, that I don't see anything wrong with it, he gets 10 days in court. You have another chap going out there, uh, Stephen Atubiga, uh, also, you know, literally declaring his own Armageddon, he gets three days. One, uh, Ken Boahene, you know, gets off the hook. But we're just trying to find out. This fine line, where does it actually start and end? When do you know you have crossed it? Because indeed... Folks, this same free speech which Samir Wuku used uh, against the judges, it is that same free speech that I need to use to sanitize the public. So we're here to talk about it. In the studio with me is Theodore Jeble, who is the Public Affairs Director for uh, Center for Democratic Development. <laughs> we're going to have an interesting <laughs> conversation today. Thank you so much for having me. Free speech. When we say free speech, I hear people talk about responsibility, responsibility. Fyodor, apart from me saying that I bought a Cadillac and today I'm going to hack down Theodore or I've got a gun and I've loaded it with bullets and I'm going to shoot my girlfriend, I am free to express my will, your will or any will and if you're not happy with it, take me to court. Sure, I mean, <laughs> you're free to express your opinion on any matter under the face of the earth, um, free speech is a right. Mm -hmm. It is constitutionally guaranteed, and it's a right for all. In fact, it's like the air we breathe. You know, if you take away speech, it's like taking away the air that you breathe. You die. Because, mm -hmm. you know, human beings, naturally, we are meant to be expressive. Mm -hmm. We speak our minds, we speak through our gestures, and all that. So, um, Free speech is critical. In fact, it's the mother of all rights in a democracy. And so all of us should preserve it. We should fight for it. We should ensure that we have it in a democracy. Even though uh, the Constitution does not say that uh, you need to be responsible for me to give you free speech, it gives free speech to everyone, responsible or irresponsible. Where do we draw the line of responsibility? Well, um, when what you seek to speak, what you seek to say, becomes libelous to somebody, even your communication, uh, you seek to provide baseless, you know, arguments against somebody in a way that seeks to incriminate the person unjustifiably, uh, you probably will be going beyond your, your, your rights. The reason is that, you know, things like um, reputation is hard to come by. It takes you years to build your reputation, your credibility. And all of us live and eat our reputations. I mean, I'm sure when you talk about multi-TV, what has kept you in business, apart from your professionalism, has been your name, your brand. Mm -hmm. And so if tomorrow morning you hear that somebody is out there, you know, muffing, bad muffing, multi TV, you probably will find that to be injurious. And so there is the freedom 
that is guaranteed by the Constitution as a right. But there's the, there's the need to balance that freedom such that in trying to express yourself and what you think and what you feel, you don't end up hating somebody. So when you hate somebody, when you injure somebody's reputation, that is when you know, people begin to talk about the fact that you are going beyond the boundaries. Um, so, but, but the truth of the matter too is that what one person may consider outrageous mm -hmm. and probably libelous, mm -hmm. somebody else in a different context may interpret that to mean a different thing. That is why, you know, when it comes to content, for example, it's difficult to be define be exactly. Before we, before mm. we move to content, mm. if somebody out there mm. felt that uh, multimedia was very biased in the way they broadcast it, you know, I've been listening to multimedia because they are too biased and I don't find any education with them. If 99 people thought otherwise, and he thought that, you know, that's what I think, well, why can't he think that? He's also entitled to his free speech, and that is his free speech. And he can publish it, sign it, sing it, you know, jump to it. Yeah, probably as a, as a company, as a corporation, uh, there are those who are responsible for managing your image and your reputation. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who take it up. Probably it's not everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, when the comment is made and it portrays the the company in a bad light, and that comment takes away some goodwill, public goodwill, mm -hmm. to the extent that it affects your business, it affects people's uh, respect for you, or even, let's say that it kind of hurts your business operations, then of course you are, you are entitled to take the person on. Uh -huh. So yes, free speech should be free at all times, just that you need to be cautious that what you are saying at any point in time is not libelous, is not contemptuous. You know, you don't seek to take away somebody, somebody else's right in trying to exercise your own right. You don't take away somebody else's right. You see, we, we talk about that, but as a nation, we have used Section 208 of the Criminal Code, you know, a few times. Uh, this gentleman once upon a time said that... Uh, Ex-President Rawlings mm. bent down his own house. Mm. So we use, uh, as a state, used Section 208 to say that he's causing fear and panic. Right. And then, you know, hold him to court or whatever that thing is. But uh, that was his free speech. Mm. It might be right or wrong, you know. And I think, I didn't say might, I mean, it was wrong, mm. you know. Uh, from where we stand, it was completely wrong. But if he thought that, no, this house looks like, you know, this chap bent it down, uh, all we should have done was, you know, take him to a civil court and then, you know, see what we do. But the, as the state or the nation uh, or government machinery, you know, applied Section 208 of this criminal code. So if you keep Section 208 of the criminal code, how mm. then do you support it with, you know, Article 21 of our same constitution mm -hmm. that's guaranteeing somebody mm -hmm. free speech? Mm -hmm. Well, that is problematic. That is problematic. But I guess the point in the is that um, probably apart from going to the courts, there should be some ways of seeking redress when somebody, for example, uh, uh, is, is seen to be using language to so diminish another person. You probably are thinking about other measures, mm -hmm. other measures that as a nation we, we can say that, well, this is where we want to go. When it comes to, say, the media, for example, instead of going to court, you probably may want to look at the National Media Commission, for example. Mm -hmm. Is the NMC able to you know, use their mandate to institute some reconciliation between people who feel you know, ag uh, aggrieved as far as free speech is concerned? And you know, we, we, we have that arrangement already here in Ghana, where people who feel hurt by media reportage you know, appeal to the NMC for redress. Mm -hmm. And this is a system that we have to groom as a nation. It's just that we have not been able to groom it. We have left the NMC in a rather sordid state. We've starved it of funds. So they are unable to exercise the functions that otherwise 
they should be exercising. What does the CDD yeah. think? This, uh, I mean, it all started with Samia Uku. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, freedom of speech has been hindered in a way? Yes, we think so. CDD thinks so. Um, because we think that, number one, are we saying that if you have a case in court before a judge, is it not legitimate for people to make comment on the case? Because the case is in court, does it mean that nobody else is able to make comment on the case? That is worrying to CDD Ghana. And we also think that, you know, there is the need to balance what we call, uh, what we call contempt, you know, contempt, with you know, the constitutional right of free speech. And so that thin line between, you know, what will allow the court to smoothly administer justice vis-a-vis -vis the right of the individual, that thin line is what we want to be able to bring out. I have an insert here, uh, and it's by uh, uh, Mr. Kisi Ejabing, Eja who's a, a law lecturer, yeah, yeah. explaining what contempt of court yeah. will be. So I think they'll play it now, right. and then we'll listen to what he, uh, he tries to uh, uh, explain to us. But we, our other worry... Yeah, let, let's, let's okay. see that. Contempt itself is a little bit ill-defined. Its province is not too much well laid out. And because speech or the effect of a speech is likely to sound differently in one context and another. And if I, I think that if I'm a judge, some speech or publication made by someone amounts to contempt of court, it does not necessarily mean that another judge may hold the same view. For instance, let's take the case itself, the very first one involving Samia Uku. I won't go to the word hypocritical. I'll just stick to the word selective. It does not necessarily mean that if you say that a court is being selective in the administration of justice, it is necessarily contemptuous of the court. Because what I may conceptualize as selective may not be cast in an insulting manner. That is to say, well, I've opened my eyes wide to some people, and I'm really not opening my eyes that wide. Comments being made by some people. As I said, I won't go to the word hypocritical because uh, no matter how you look at it, it, it kind of sounds in insulting language. The danger is this. It is a very highly subjective nature of the concept of contempt itself, especially when it comes to speech. If I may, senior, can I use the word contemni? The person who, <laughs> the person who commits <laughs> contempt is called contempt now. So, <laughs> so maybe the person who feels contempted, if I may say that way, is the contemni. The danger is this. Very highly subjective as far as speech is concerned. But then again, when it comes to uh, the clear case we saw last week, that. The complainant is the prosecutor, and at the same time, the judge. It is highly, 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 highly dangerous. Maybe the Supreme Court we have now did very well in restraining itself a little bit, three days, ten days. But if we are to leave it in the hands of men and women, one day we may not have three days and ten days. That is the danger. And that is what I fear. That is what I fear. And I said something, that we should not interpret this whole concept or apply this whole concept of contempt in such a way as to whittle away the, the, the right to free speech itself or to do it in a way that will impair fundamental human dignity. I'm saying this because of some of the comments that were passed by the judges when these individuals were brought before it. Uh, we are all witnesses to what some of them said. But I, I will not quote back uh, those words. As confusing as it may, mm -hmm. it did sanitize the, the, uh, the press a little bit. 
uh, you know, people who normally hop from radio station to radio station and say ill stuff, calm down a bit. Well, I hope so. That is a territory that you cannot really predict because um, as long as issues arise every day, people will want to comment. And don't forget that this is the very first time that as a nation, all of us are taken to the courtroom mm -hmm. to see what is happening there in the courtroom. So you are in the you know, privacy of your house, of your home, and then you are right there in the courtroom. Now, all this gives room for very robust public discussions because we all see it. Once mm -hmm. you see it, you want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. There are things you probably you don't like. Maybe somebody says something that you didn't like. So we all talk about it. So the question is this. In our decision to publicly air the election petition, did we, you know, make room for this kind of commentary, public commentary, from the different corners of Ghana? Mm -hmm. Did we make room? And mind you, the media in Ghana, is, 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 we've done well over the years, but we are still young. The media is still young. The democracy itself is young. And it's not an excuse, though. It is not an excuse. It's not an excuse. But that is why you need to give room for try and people will err, but they learn as they move along. They're going to have to come down with the hammer every time that somebody, you know, is perceived to have, you know, scandalized the court. Where are we going to end? For example, just yesterday, I heard another announcement in the Supreme Court that somebody else had made a comment. You know, you're going to listen to the how, tape. How, is, is that going to be the way we will be going as a nation? Some people, some people are actually pushing for an independent body, so that the Supreme Court is not seen as the prosecutors, those who you know do, they investigate, they prosecute, and then they pass down the sentence. They are pushing for some other body to also play a role. So it's, it's not they are not seen as. You know, they're all and all. In other words, there's the fear that this whole undefined area of contempt, you know, provides the judges with such vast power, so vast that, you know, you don't know what will happen tomorrow. You see, mm. even if I bring an independent body, mm. uh, this independent body may even find the comment more... Uh, you know, contemptuous than the first judge did because, like you were saying, it's speech and people react to speech differently. Something that I might, you know, laugh over it, you may cry about it, some might, might you know, kill about it. So, it, it has, you then keep having watchmen and watchmen and watchmen no, and watchmen. See, they, they may, but then there will have been a procedure, a laid down guideline, which we can all see and identify with. Now, the way it is now, like you heard him say, only the learned justices are able to interpret what is contemptuous. Let's, let's take another insert and see if we can get to the bottom line of this. For the Supreme Court's decisions on the contempt cases, uh, many people say they threaten free speech. Well, this is not a black and white case as far as I'm concerned. Certainly, the decisions are likely to affect, in my opinion, uh, the media, media and the public's comments on the work and outcomes of the work of the judiciary. This would be very obvious because, especially since most media workers in this country, uh, or the majority of uh, media uh, workers in this country, have very little professional training and therefore, they might have the tendency to hands off the courts and court matters, in which case the result will be the courts becoming immune or isolated from public scrutiny. Uh, but generally, apart from the NDC and the MPP and their leaders, who consistently appear to be encouraging the use of the media to foment animosity and needless polarization of society, I suspect most decent and patriotic citizens are likely to be appalled by a media culture that relentlessly insists on promoting wayward, disruptive propaganda. A media culture that seems to relish nurturing ignorance and sectarian political partisanship. Yet, 
provocative, irritating, divisive, and unedifying as much of the media output on political affairs tend to be, the critical question is what must be done to media and persons who use the media when they express themselves in ways that commit outrageous and offensive acts such as impugning the integrity of the courts, parliament, or other cherished institutions of our democracy. In essence, must contempt of court, for example, be such a criminal act that it leads to the imprisonment of the offender? What is it that if media publish or a citizen expresses must be such that it must be a criminal act punishable by imprisonment? On the face of it, one would think that the spirit and letter of the Constitution makes it impossible to criminalize any form of speech or publication. Now, the, the, the Supreme Court's actions under discussion come in the context of legitimate concerns by large sections of our society that the outcome of the election petition case is not taken as a basis for violent acts against the stability and peace of the society. But speech by itself does not lead to violent acts. This is even very clear in the Rwanda case that is so often and glibly cited. Very insightful dimension there. <clears throat> very insightful dimension there. What I want to add to it, you see, if this case was Ghana Railways versus VRA, or this case was STC versus, you know, Yam Ponsan, and somebody commented and the judge called and gave three days and ten days, I wouldn't be bothered. But if this case is MPP NDC, you know, the very two parties with a huge majority with sentiment raging all over. And the undertone is that, uh, you know, the winning party obviously wants to stay in power. Uh, the losing party also wants to have an opportunity where the judgment goes in their favor that they come into power, which has been the bane of Ghana. Then I believe that in this particular case, there's no freedom of speech. Everybody should just stay home and just be prepared for whatever the judges bring up. If any other case, let's comment. But with these two parties, with about 10 million, you know, standing army, all waiting to have the decision go their way, I don't think we'd have room for anybody to even cough on the matter. Well, that will mean some kind of media blackout on the, on the, on the petition. And if you do that, you probably are going to create more problems. Because then everybody's in the dark. <laughs> Nobody knows what is going to happen. You know, so, I mean, the, the point that Professor Kakari made mm -hmm. about the fact that speech in itself does not lead to violence is something we probably want to, you know, interrogate further. Because what he sought to say there is that, yes, speech is important. It can lead to... It, it can it lead... It can incite people. Yeah, it can incite. But, you see, when you make the speech, it must take some form of mobilization of people, you know, to commit an act. So you probably should, instead of, you know, penalizing people for making that speech, why don't you have your security operatives on the lookout? So they look out for any kind of mobilization that anybody is trying to, you know, organize as a result of the speech. But, you see, Fyodor, is it not mm. difficult? Because, I mean, mm. we have what? 10,000 army or policemen, if that, yeah. policing 25 million people and, uh, you know, uh, pockets of people can gather in any part of the country. There are people who literally sit by their radio and that's his only source of information. That's it. Yeah. He is unable to read or write. So all he's waiting for is a member of his or her political party to come on at 5 o'clock and tell him or her what went to court and how far things are going. So he or she then hears that, oh, no, the judges seem to not talking for us. They're talking for the other side. These things should be stopped, especially mm. MPP and DC. If it's railways and highways issue, it doesn't matter. No, but even that, if there's a miscarriage of justice in one case, tomorrow morning can happen to you. Even in one case, 
This one is a national matter. Mm -hmm. But even let's take it, let's bring it to the level of the individual. Where maybe Yakuza's mother in some village somewhere is you know, held in contempt for having said something in a lower court that nobody knows or nobody gets to hear about. What about that? So, you know, we should be thankful that we are seeing it happen right now before our own eyes at the Supreme Court level. At the lower court level, you will not be there, will not be there, there will not be any media <laughs> for us to even know that it has happened to your grandmother or your grandfather. You take it coolly, you go in, nobody gets to know about it. The last time that, I, I think it was in 1998, when Kweku and Haruna Atta, if you remember that story, they went in for 30, 30 days. You know, this time it's just 10 and 3. Mm -hmm. So really, it really it calls for concern, and all of us should, we cannot afford not to, to say that um, because of the fear of contempt, we'll we we do a blackout of what's happening. If the case wasn't mm -hmm. as big as this, mm -hmm. I think the judges would not have bothered Sami Oku or anybody who spoke. But if and if in any case, mm -hmm. those guys would not have even been so sentimental. You know, we get very sentimental when these two parties are involved. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. But the other thing to note is that most of the you know, media houses in Ghana are really owned by politicians. They own their media houses. You make, make a count. Mm -hmm. You see MPP here, you see NDC here, you see MPP here, you see NDC here. All, you know, they, 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 when they come at first, they seek to hide their identity. But eventually it comes out. And you get to know who is behind the radio stations. And the practice has been that because it belongs to a, a political party, we told their line. You do propaganda. You just do propaganda. You just bring in your supporters to lambast, you know, the other party, and then they also bring their supporters to lambast. And that is the kind of media practice that we're having here in Ghana. And that is at the root of the problem. In all this, you know, and I keep saying that uh, Samir Wuku or Stephen Atubiga, you know, did not have a dondo or a gong gong, and he went on every street beating it and making his announcement. He used a platform, either a newspaper or a radio station, where do they come in? Stay tuned, we're coming right back. Well, just before we went on the break, uh, well, we are talking about free speech and if it's been uh, hindered or if it's been touched uh, with the uh, Supreme Court judges' action that they're taking now, where everybody's holding to court. If you dare say anything which they don't deem uh, fit for you to say, then you are in contempt of court. Uh, a fine line where nobody seems to know where it is. It depends on the day, it depends on the judge, it depends on so many factors if you're going to be in contempt or not. But what we're saying is all these people who are being hauled to court somehow used a medium, TV, radio, newspapers. Uh, we can't even touch social media yet, but let's just stick to the ones that are regulated. What then happens to us, Tudor? Because, you know, I call a minister and say, well, you know, this is what happened to this person in court. What do you have to say to that? He mouths off on my platform. Hey, uh, I said, no, I'm not going to retract my words. I stand by my words. And then the following day, the person is called. So the media house, are we immune just because we said, oh, I've retracted myself from what you were saying? But you know that there is some other development, which is that it looks like some of the media houses now have, are replaying comments that they consider to be prejudicial, mm -hmm. that, you know, maybe See if the judges will hear somebody it. from the NDC or the MVP had said earlier who they think is prejudicial, then they play it on their networks. You know, it's like trying to, if you like, set a trap for... <laughs> stop, stop the fires. Let's see what happens. And, 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 and that is happening right now in Ghana. So the question is, are we going to have, you know, the justices you know, go around hunting for such, 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 such cases? The, you see, uh, I strongly believe, I, I don't have the silver bullet, mm -hmm. I don't know what the silver mm -hmm. bullet is, mm -hmm. but I strongly believe that so far as these two parties are concerned, they, you know, you, you, there must be a limit to what they say about the case, especially in terms of informing your, your, your supporters that, uh, 
you know, you know, be, beware because the case is not going our way. Or somebody comes on in and says, you know what, if the case goes our way, we're going to go and chop off the heads of all the opposition. Uh, things like that. I mean, when you say people from the two parties should not comment, that is hard to swallow. Then what are the rights? Uh, especially, I'm talking about, uh, mm. should I say leaders or mm. like communicators, mm. the official communicators mm. of the main parties. Mm. I think the only thing they're supposed to say is that this case can go anywhere. So just go down on your knees in church and pray or go down on your knees in the mosque and pray that it goes that way. And that's an open and closed book. Let's just, just wait for what happens. Because there, there are two people in court and it could go either way. You don't want us to go back to the culture of silence. The time on, when on, people, on the, people on, were afraid to on make On this comments. particular issue, I think we need to go back to the culture of silence. On this issue. Then the, where are the rights that we, you and I are seeking to, to preserve? And well, I mean, to, this is not going to be the only case we're going to take to court. Yeah. But where you have, you know, I mean, look, when we went to do biometric, people died. Mm. We just had to leave our homes, write our names, and turn print. People died because there was MPP and DC involved. You do a, a by election and people die. Uh, there's an MP there already. The MP passes out or moves to become a minister. They're trying to find somebody else there. People will die. And here the stakes are so high that we've gone through an election and now we want to see if it was fair or not. And I say, those nine guys there are competent. Yeah. Let everybody just say that. It could go either way. Just go down and knees and pray. That's the open and close comment on this particular case and make it law. What? Any other case, you can come You have your free speech. <laughs> you know, professionalism takes time to build. And that's something that we should all know here in Ghana. That our democracy is fairly, I mean, is fairly young. You know, and so because of the fact that it is young, we should make room for some, some mistakes. There should be enough room for some mistakes. It should be a self-correcting system. You know, so that I mean, that is what really makes us human beings, because we are able to express ourselves the way we think, the way we feel. Of course, with the, with the caveat that it should be within you know, uh, defined you know, boundaries. Um, if we take, for example, the, the role of bodies like the Ghana Independent you know, GIBA, mm -hmm. Rockers Association GIBA and the NMC, I think that groups like that should begin to intensify their you know, training of media men so that you know, with time we can say that we are beginning to groom you know, seasoned professional media. As it is now, we don't have that. And so if you don't have that and you are, you are expecting them to be suddenly professional and to make comments that are you know, acceptable, you know, you probably will be asking for too much. If you, if you look at the quality and the caliber of the people who man some of these networks, I mean, look at the kind of questions they ask on their, on, their, on their platforms. So the thing, I believe, is not to go around looking for who said what yesterday, and then you nail him tomorrow morning. The thing is giving room for the system to grow and correct itself. With time, we'll overcome all this. I will uh, go back to my yeah. thing about how yeah. some people rely on radio for the information. Yeah. I was listening to a radio station that broadcasts in Tree. At the time, uh, Mrs. Rollins has broken away from NDC and had formed NDP. And uh, ex-president Rollins had made a speech saying that, well, she's an adult. And I and her words. I think his words were. Like, mm -hmm. I think that if he needs to, if she wants to set up on her own, mm -hmm. uh, she's strong enough to do it. Yeah, and the right, right thing to do is just resign from the NDC so she can start her NDP. That, that, those were the, That's the tone mm -hmm. and the speech that he made. The translation in key was that, and I'll say it in English. <laughs> oh, if she wants to go, she can go. We are fed up with her. We are. I am so fed up with her, and she can go. Now I can. If if. If I didn't understand English <laughs> and my only <laughs> language was tree, I then would have thought that that is what President Rollins said. You see, so that, that's why I'm saying that with, with, these, <laughs> with this particular <laughs> case, if, if Justice Atukuba yeah. leaves it and says, oh, 
uh, there's Article 21 here and there's the UN Charter here, we will, we will end up in Sierra Leone and Liberia in no time. Well, some of the, some of the lawyers at today's forum made that point, especially from the Ghana Bar Association. They made that point. They, they think that there should be confines, there should be boundaries beyond where you cannot cross, that if you cross, the hammer will come down on you. And then we are saying that, well, this hammer is not supposed to be coming down on us. We are the ones who are supposed to be, you know, aiding the work of the judiciary. They are there for us. In fact, they are there to actually protect and preserve our rights. They are not there to, you know, come down on us every time we, we cough. <laughs> is it, is it, there's, a third, there's a third insect, so let's see, <laughs> let's see what the third insect is. Contentious. Now, when we look at this particular case that has um, brought us here, it's a televised event. And so, us with all natural televised events, we're likely to have robust public discussion around it. And that's the sort of thing that fuels democracy. And yet, there appears to be no clear process in the course of arriving at the judgment that deprived the social commentator and the journalist their liberty that could help clarify the fault lines in the minds of the Ghanaian public who are part of this event and who, because we're a democracy, feel at liberty to comment and have public discussions in the public sphere. I take the view, as others have, that there should have been some complaint settlement process to address the issue first. And if that fails, to address the problem, then other mechanisms are there. After all, we have the National Media Commission to settle complaints, and maybe we need to explore that, even if we haven't in the past, because we're learning and we are looking at ways around it. It would have provided guidance for us all. Rather, the public education we got and keep getting comes in the form of general warnings from the court that people should be restrained in how they make comments about the judges, court actions and decisions. I read a publication this morning, your honorable moderator, and uh, that, that was quoting verbatim a warning from the president of the panel. And it says, some of the publications we've seen can be contempt, but we choose to let those that are not too grievous to pass. Otherwise, many people will suffer. But there was a publication on the Enquara front page and then some tape being played over the radio, and all sorts of things. In the course of time, we will deal with that. And it came from the Daily Graphic, and they were quoting, they seem to be quoting verbatim. Now, what such pronouncements do is to put a general chill on public utterances and media coverage, because it is not clear what is not too grievous. For a people who tolerated for a long time a culture of silence, many will say it is better to simply keep quiet and be safe than sorry. Now, if we go on that path, we are doing a disservice to our democracy because democracy calls for robust public discussion, including on very difficult or uncomfortable issues. Our public discussions cannot be left only to officialdom. Considering that in any modern society, the media represent one of the foremost vehicles by which we can have national conversations, I've been rather perplexed that media associations, GJA, GIBA, PRIMPAC, have not sought to clarify and defend speech rights. She makes a very good point as to uh, where does the public, you know, what can the public say and the public not say? I uh, so I agree with it, but my concern is about the professional communicators belonging to MPP and NDC. They, I think, we need to mute them. I suggest that at six o'clock, I think Radio Ghana goes nationwide. They should have every language telling the citizens exactly what went on in court today in Gatri, Ewe, Dangbe, Hausa, and then we all just sit and listen unbiasedly what went on and form a judgment. Because as soon as, you see, if you listen to an MPP communicator, you would even wonder why NDC guys are coming to court because they've won the case. And vice versa, if you listen to an NDC mm -hmm. communicator, you think, oh, mm -hmm. these guys are wasting their time. And people obviously belong to these two parties and that's how they're being fed. 
Because if I'm MPP, I tune to an MPP radio station. If I'm NDC, I tune to an NDC radio station. So I'm constantly being fed that, oh, we are winning the case. If all of a sudden one day I tune in and say, oh, we didn't win the case, ah, the judge is by us. So why don't we, on this particular case alone, at 6 o'clock, have every language being broadcast, a radio, Ghana, or GTV, explaining to us exactly what we're doing? <laughs> it will be tantamount to taking away our rights to, de to, de to, to determine what kind of media outlet you want to listen to. Why should you really impose, you know, a particular media That's house a piece on of the me? nation? No. That, the listen, that is the not nation. what would bring us peace. I mean, you can, you can, you can disrupt the peace without necessarily, you know, using radio. Okay. So that is rather, if you like, an oppressive, <laughs> oppressive and, 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 you know, what other way should I use? That, that is not the way to go. The way to go is to educate the people constantly. Okay. Allow the But the educators are the mm -hmm. ones who are propagating all these agitations. The loud mouths who could go to the radio stations, who instead of telling us that, listen, it's a two-man race, and one would win, one would lose. The last they time, the, the last time, one of the, I think it was the, the chair of the justices, he made a comment. He said this case was being fought on two fronts, one within the court, at legally, and then the other one politically. So we understand that, that what goes, what, what goes on in the courtroom, is different from what goes outside the courtroom. Mm -hmm. And as much as um, you want to ensure that what goes outside the courtroom represents, I mean, is exactly what actually transpires within the courtroom, the, the system to check that is not what we are doing right now. Because I, ideally, ideally, if it's about reportage, media reportage, probably media not presenting the, 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 the case the way it happened in court, what, for example, prevents the, the court to do a news release and say, this is what actually happened in court? They should have their own public communication and public relations but then it department. Be, uh, you see, that what? provides information to correct what they think that the media is scandalizing. That should be their job. But because that's what happens everywhere. If, if CDD does a statement and we think that somebody else is not using it properly, what do we do? We come on air, we do the right thing, and we say, this is what we said. What you are saying is not what we said. Matter close. Fiora, but that's exactly what happens in court. Yeah. They, they, they go through a court proceedings, and it could be the simplest court proceedings that day. They didn't expect that, you know, you tune on the radio and you say that, oh, this is exactly what happened. And it's completely the opposite. So that's why I'm saying that if we gag everyone and then have one channel you, you, you to can't, report. Don't go there. You can't gag. We have, we have, we have gone beyond the era of no, gagging. You see, I'm not gagging you know. every single case. I'm just yeah. gagging this In fact, this one, you, case. you can't gag this case. You can't gag this case. So don't even attempt it. Because it, there's so much, you know, so, so much political will, you know, political strategy, you know, depends on this particular case. And it's actually good for Ghana. It will either strengthen us you know, strengthen our democracy, build us up, unify us, or divide us as a nation. Let me take a line from us, but <laughs> it's going to bring us together or divide us, but I hope it brings us together. We're coming back straight back. <laughs> Well, the same freedom of speech that we get penalized on for expressing your opinion on a matter, maybe your choice of word or your, uh, your phrase or your tone, it is that same freedom of speech that the state requires you to go out there to sensitize the general public into falling in line. When do we use it and when do we not use it? Uh, do we take this case aside, as I am propagating, <laughs> and then in every other thing else we fall in line? Uh, because you know things, Ghana must come first, you know. And that is why we need a sensible balance. A sensible balance. The judges must protect you know, the courts from being abused. At the same time, people's rights to free speech must be, must be, must be allowed to... To, to, to be expressed. People must feel free to express their right to free speech. It's constitutional right. People should not be controlled. People should not be, you shouldn't clamp down on people. Let them express their freedom. After all, I mean, like Professor Kakare said, he said, what I thought is in a speech 
that by merely you know saying something on radio on TV, we think that it is so powerful that the whole nation will come down. Which is not to say that you know it, it cannot bring incitement. It can, but with the kind of democracy we are practicing, we have chosen that we want to go this way, and so. There should be that fine balance between what the court considers to be contemptuous and what is the right of the individual to freely express constitutionally. There's never going to be a silver bullet. So what's the way forward? Well, the way forward, I think, is to get the NMC to do much more of this work. So the NMC can begin to, you know, come in and rain down airing media men and, and get them to do what they want them to. I mean, it will take time, but that is the way to go. When you do it that way, you will be watering the seeds of democracy in Ghana. You will not be seek, seeking to give it with the left hand and then take it with the right. That is the way we should go. Then there should be more education of the public, you know, about the need for us to be united as a nation, the you know, pastors, the religious leaders, you know, civil society, we should all take it up. But they're all divided. I mean, they are same, I'm not going to mention churches, but there are mm. certain churches we are tied to certain political parties. Well, it's not all of them. It's not all of them. A few may be, but the majority of them are, are not you know, that, that, that political. So we probably should begin to go that way and allow the system to grow and correct itself. Again, as aren't we so divisive as a nation that the justices don't have a choice but to use these measures? Are we not too divided? Well, we are divided. We are polarized. Um, somebody was given a scenario, an example today. He said that at the time that Kukubako and Haruna Atta were, were, were convicted, you know, there was so much sympathy, even empathy for them. People were, you know, praying for them. Some people were holding vigil, you know. But today, <laughs> what you see is different. It's, it's a very polarized country. It's like some people are really enjoying it and others are against it. So we are polarized. But the solution is not to come down with a hammer. The hammer cannot stop the polarity. But when you allow people to express themselves, I mean, they are taking off the, the, the heat from their chest. If it stays within, you don't know what they will do. But when they speak, at least it gives you room to begin to plan, to, to think ahead and look out for possible uh, 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 outcomes, even before they happen. Let them say it. That, give you, that can even give you a lead as to what people are thinking about, what they are plotting, rather than letting them go underground. That way you can't contain it. You see, Theodore, we mm. have discussed this court case mm. you know, for an hour. But I'm sure we won't be called on Monday because of how <laughs> we discussed it. And there's nothing wrong in the way we yeah. discussed it. Right. But how do we guarantee that people stay within this level of discussion? Yeah, by all means express it. I think the judges are right. You think the judges are wrong. But in, in, in a sanitized way. Yeah. And so how do we ensure people stay within this line if we don't come down with the hammer? Well, of course, what we can actually also do in addition to what I have just proposed, is to get the politicians to rain down their people. As I heard the last time that the MPP has sent out some communication guidelines mm -hmm. for their members to begin to ensure that in their commenting on the, on the case, they don't end up you know, abusing the judges and stuff like that. More of that kind of caution will be important. That's what we need. We need to have, say, President John Mahama publicly, you know, Reprimand his people for maybe a foul comment they have made somewhere on radio or something they have published you know, in print. We need to see that example. We need to see, for example, Nana Kufu Ado, you know, taking a stand clearly and publicly, running down his people and saying, look, you can't make this comment. We don't accept that. That is what we are not getting. And it appears that their silence may mean complicity. We are not sure. But it's critical that in addition to getting the NMC and all the other bodies, Jiba and Co, to all come on board. We want to see the leaders of the parties. So then we've left too much responsibility on the judges. Of course, I agree. So then they don't and have they, any they, other they, they, seem, they seem to also <laughs> to carry the thing on their shoulders. And I'm not, I don't think they, can, they are able to, 
to take it up on their shoulders and See, do it because all, by all these statements yeah. that came, I'm yeah. sure if the party leaders had immediately come up, yeah. disassociate yeah. with yeah. it and yeah. condemn, the judges might have even been calm thinking that, well, the followers would also yeah. toe the line that the party is not in association with this and this guy is standing alone. But if the parties keep quiet, then the judges don't have a choice. Well, then play it probably there. is suggestive that they probably are either, you know, quietly <laughs> and endorsing it, but that's why it will, it will amount to, it will appear to be, to, to mean. But once you don't come out clearly to condemn what has been said, you probably are, you know, some quietly fanning it. I've been speaking to uh, Theodore Jebley, who's a public affairs director of CDD. It's been exciting. The long and short is that, uh, you know, you have to keep Ghana first. You can express yourself as much as you want. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a two horse race. One is going to win. Uh, it's going to be the faith of nine justices who decides, you know, who wins. And whoever wins, and if Ghana is safe, I think we're all going to accept it. My name is Anan Sakwa. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you for having Stay me. Stay tuned, and tomorrow we're about to do it all over again. <laughs> <laughs>